what I've decided to do is go into a particular sutta that describes the kind of thing that we're talking about and see if we can do this for you um, in a brief block of time so that you can learn a little bit about some of the characters that are in the uh, texts that we meet when we study them and you can begin to understand the approach that the Buddha was trying to show people about taking unwholesome feelings and tendencies and letting them go and bringing up wholesome ones to create new, healthy, wholesome patterns of behavior that make life easier and makes it easier for you to smile. So this is the Samana Mandika Sutta. And uh, I'm going to start reading this to you and stop and explain as I go along. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathapindika's Park. Now it was on that occasion that the wanderer, Ugahamana, Samana Mandika Putta, was staying at Malika's Park, the single-hauled Tinduka plantation for the philosophical debates. And they were together with a large following of wanderers, with as many as 300 wanderers. You just have to see this in the forest, you know. Uh, Malika's Park was a single-hauled huge plantation that had been built by the wealthier people for these wanderers to come and hold debates and talk about the Dhamma. And this is where they were staying. At that time, the carpenter Panjakanga went out from Soati at midday in order to see the Blessed One. And then he thought, it is not the right time to see the Blessed One. He is still in retreat and it is not the right time to see the monks worthy of esteem because they are still in retreat. So suppose I go to Malinko's Park and to the wanderer Ugahamana Samana Mandika Puta, and he went to Malinko's Park. Now on that occasion, this wanderer Ugahamana was seated with a large assembly of wanderers who were making an uproar and they were loudly and they were noisily talking many kinds of pointless talk as talking about kings and everything the Buddha said was not to be talked about and whether things are so this way or so that way they were discussing all these types of things and the wanderers saw uh, that the carpenter Panja Congo was coming in the distance and seeing him he quieted down his assembly thus Sirs, be quiet, sirs, make no noise, for here comes the carpenter Panjakanga, who is the disciple of the recluse Gotama, one of the recluse Gotama's white-clothed lay disciples, who is staying in Sawati. These venerable ones like quiet, they are disciplined in quiet, and he will think to join us if we are quiet. And then the wanderers became silent. Well, the carpenter Panjakanga, he went to the wanderer and exchanged greetings with him. And when his courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. And the wanderer then said to him, Carpenter, when a man possesses four qualities, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the supreme attainment, an ascetic who is invincible. What are the four? And here he does evil, no evil bodily actions. He utters no evil speech. He has no evil intentions. And he does not make his living by any evil livelihood. And when a man possesses these four qualities, I describe him as being accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, and attained in the supreme attainment, an ascetic who is invincible. 
Well, then the carpenter Panjikanga neither approved nor disapproved of what was said, and without doing either, he rose from his seat and he went away thinking, I shall learn the meaning of this statement in the presence of the Blessed One. And this was the way of the followers of the Buddha. They would often uh, you know, hear something said and rather than get into a discussion, they would just go back to the Blessed One and ask the meaning of it. And then he went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and reported to the Blessed One his entire conversation with the wanderer Ugamahana. And thereupon the Blessed One said this, if that were so, Carpenter, then a young and tender infant who was lying prone is accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained in the supreme attainment already, an ascetic invincible according to this wanderer's statement. For the young and tender infant who is lying prone doesn't even have the notion of body, so how could he do any evil action beyond mere wiggling? And a young and tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion of speech, so how could he even utter evil speech before, beyond his whining? How could he do that? And a young and tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion of intention. And so how should he have evil intentions beyond making a sulking action? And a young and tender infant lying prone does not even have the motion of livelihood. So how should he make his living by evil livelihood beyond being suckled at his mother's breast? If that were so, Carpenter, then this young and tender infant lying prone is accomplished in what is wholesome already according to this wanderer's statement. When a man possesses four qualities, Carpenter, I describe him not as accomplished in what is wholesome or perfected in what is unwholesome, uh, on, uh, what is wholesome, or attained in this supreme attainment, uh, or as an aesthetic who is invincible but as one who stands in the same category as the young, tender infant who is lying prone. What are the four? He does no evil bodily actions. He utters no evil speech. He has no evil intentions. He does not make his living by any evil livelihoods. And when the man possesses these four qualities, I describe him not as accomplished, but as one who stands in the same category as the young and tender infant who is lying prone. When a man possesses ten qualities, Carpenter, ten qualities, that is when I describe him as accomplished, in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the supreme attainment, an ascetic who is invincible. But first of all, I will say, it must be understood this way. These are unwholesome habits, and thus the unwholesome habits originate from this, and thus unwholesome habits cease without remainder here. And thus one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits. Does that sound familiar to us? This is the practice we are advocating. And I say, said the Buddha, it must be understood thus. These are wholesome habits, and thus wholesome habits originate from this, and thus wholesome habits cease without remainder here, and thus one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of wholesome habits. And I say that it must be understood thus. These are unwholesome intentions, and thus the unwholesome intentions originate from this. And thus the unwholesome intentions cease and without remainder, and thus one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of unwholesome intentions. And I say that it must be understood thus. 
These are wholesome intentions. And thus wholesome intentions originate from this. And the wholesome intentions cease without remainder here. One practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of wholesome intentions. So what are the unwholesome habits? This is the question. They are the unwholesome bodily actions, unwholesome verbal actions, and evil unwholesome lifestyle. These are called the unwholesome habits. And what do these unwholesome habits originate from? They originate, their or origin is stated, they should be said to originate from the mind. For mind is the forerunner of all things. What mind, he says? Though mind is multiple, varied, and of different aspects, there is mind affected by lust, by hate, and by delusion. Unwholesome habits originate from this. And where do these unwholesome habits cease without remainder? The cessation is stated here. A monk abandons bodily misconduct and he develops good bodily conduct. He abandons verbal misconduct and develops good verbal conduct. He abandons mental misconduct and develops good mental conduct. He abandons wrong livelihood and gains a living by right, healthy livelihood. And in it is here that the unwholesome habits cease without remainder. And how practicing does he practice this way to the cessation of his unwholesome habits? Here a monk awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen evil, unwholesome states, and he makes effort. He arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. He awakens enthusiasm for the abandoning of arisen evil unwholesome states, and he awakens enthusiasm for the arising of unarisen wholesome states, and he awakens enthusiasm for the continuance, the non-disappearance, the strengthening, the increase, and the fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. And he makes effort, arouses energy, and one so practicing practices the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits. This is how it's done. And what are these wholesome habits? They are wholesome bodily actions, wholesome verbal actions, and the purification of lifestyle. These are called the wholesome habits. And what do these wholesome habits originate from? Their origin is stated they should be said to originate from mind. Though mind is multiple and varied, there a mind unaffected by lust, by hate, and by delusion. Wholesome habits originate in this way. Mind is the forerunner of all things. Mind is the forerunner of the good behavior. Mind is the forerunner of the bad behavior, of the bad thoughts and words and deeds. And this is what we should understand. And where do these wholesome habits cease without remainder? Their cessation is stated. A monk who is virtuous, but he does not identify with his virtue, and he understands that it actually is deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, where these wholesome habits cease without remainder. He understands exactly how this works. And practicing, he practices the way to the cessation of these wholesome habits. Here, the monk awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. So he practices in a way where he can subtly see and notice the arising of these. He releases them, he relaxes, he smiles, and he continues his life in a wholesome direction with the cessation of these unwholesome states and the understanding of these wholesome states. And what are the unwholesome intentions? They are the intention of sensual desire, the intention of goodwill, the intention of cruelty. And these are called the unwholesome intentions. 
And where do they originate from? Their origin is stated that they should be said to originate from perception. What perception? Though perception is multiple, varied, and different aspects, there is a perception of sensual desire, a perception of ill will, a perception of cruelty, and unwholesome intentions originate from these perceptions. You must have the perception before you carry out any action. And where do these unwholesome intentions cease without remainder? Their cessation is stated here that quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk will enter upon and abide in the jhana states, which are accompanied by supply, applied and sustained thought, the thinking and examining with joy and happiness born of seclusion. And it is here that the unwholesome intentions will cease without remainder. But it is also within your life as you practice to replace a wrong habitual action with a new habitual tendency of wholesome action. And how practicing does he practice the way to cessation? For these unwholesome intentions, he practices right effort. He practices in that way. And he recognizes the tension coming up, the arising tension in mind and in body. And he releases he relaxes and then he smiles and comes back with loving kindness and with compassion. And what are the wholesome intentions? They are the intention of renunciation, the intention of uh, loving kindness, the intention of compassion. And these are the wholesome intentions. And what? do these wholesome intentions originate from? They originate from perception. What perception? They originate from perception of mind. Though perception is multiple and varied in different aspects, there is perception of renunciation and perception of loving kindness, perception of karuna, and this wholesome intention, it originates from this. Intention precedes action, and before action happens, it, the, the intention directs the consequences of action, the degree of action. And where do these wholesome intentions cease without remainder? Their cessation is stated here with the stilling of the uh, thinking and examining thought, the monk will enter upon and abide in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and which has collectedness of mind without thinking and examining thought. And it is here that these wholesome intentions cease without remainder. So when you work with your meditation, when you take time to sit for half an hour, to sit for 40 minutes at home, if you are very still and you keep releasing and you keep relaxing, you will feel a calmness. And beyond this calmness, you will feel a joy. And beyond this joy, you will feel a very deep tranquility as you let go of these states. And how practicing does he practice the way to cessation, these wholesome intentions? How Here the monk practices right effort again. Now carpenter, when a man possessed with ten, what ten quali qualities do I describe him as accomplished? And so the Buddha has ten qualities. And in what way is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome and attained to the supreme attainment, an ascetic, invincible. Here a monk possesses the right view, the wholesome perspective of impersonally taking what happens to him in the world. This is the impersonal perspective of one beyond training. He takes the, the right intention of one beyond training, the right speech of one beyond training, the right action of one beyond training, the right lifestyle 
beyond training, the right effort which he continues to practice of one beyond training, and the right mindfulness of one who comes beyond training, and a balanced collectedness of mind for one that is beyond training. And with this he attains the right knowledge of one beyond training, and the right deliverance of one beyond training. And when a man possesses these ten qualities, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the p supreme attainment. He is an ascetic. He is an ascetic invincible. And that is what the Blessed One said. And the carpenter Panjakanga, he was satisfied with what the Blessed One's words. So we see in this sutta that there are these ten points that the Buddha considered to be invincible. That the person perfect an impersonal perspective is right view. That the person perfects a wholesome thoughts in their mind. This is right intention. That the person examines themselves in their wholesome, harmonious kind of communication with your body, with your speech, with your mind is how you communicate. That your right action is perfected because you watch very closely the harmonious movement of mind's attention. That right livelihood is accomplished because you maintain a harmonious lifestyle in keeping with the precepts and your practice. That right effort is completed because you are continually practicing a harmonious practice of this right effort in everything you do. That right mindfulness is attained because you understand harmonious observation of how mind moves. That the collectedness is a statement of the right degree of concentration in your practice. It is a refined level of concentration. Not too hard, not pointed, but open. Open to possibilities. And that through practicing in this way, you will attain full knowledge of how things work. You will understand the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and now you know, you understand the escape. To keep practicing this release in this way, and you will attain deliverance. You will detain, attain deliverance in this lifetime and you will be able to do that as a lay person or as a monastic to all different degrees and levels as you move towards Nibbana. <laughs>